I'm glad that our church can, can get back to what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Someone wisely said, the world at its worst needs the church at its best. I think that's true. Um, we, we need our church family. Many people don't recognize that. Many Christians don't recognize that. There's doctrinal philosophies that teach, that teach that you don't really need an actual church. Um, but the Bible teaches, and we'll look at some verses this, this morning about that, we do need our church family. Before we read, let's pray together, and let's ask God to bless the message, and then we'll jump right in. All right, Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for our church family. We're not perfect. Things don't always go perfectly. But Lord, you love this church. You gave yourself for it. Lord, you died for the sins of the whole world. I thank you for that truth, but you also loved the church and gave yourself for it. And Lord, you show your, our importance to you in that. You have a purpose for us reaching not only our families, but our community and our world. May we be equipped to do it. May we take that job seriously. And may we see that we must work together. And if we're going to work together, we must be together. And God, I just pray that you help me as I preach. Give me wisdom, discernment to say only the things you want said and in the manner you want them said. I pray not only for your power, but for your wisdom and discretion and discernment. Bless the invitation. May each person respond like you want them to. And God, God, I pray that you'd guide in each word I say and with each person. Turn on the light for us. Help us to see what we need to see, even in areas of our life that we don't want to see. Help those at home that are watching that could be here, some that can't. I pray that you'd help them, speak to them, encourage them. Help those that don't belong to our church that are watching, speak to their hearts as well. Help us, we pray. May people turn back to their church <laughs> and as they turn back to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's lots of ways the Bible teaches this, but uh, Jesus left us here for the purpose of being salt and light, uh, meaning uh, to make a difference for the glory of God in a purifying aspect as well as a guiding influence. Our world, and we speak of that, kind of use that, word, that phrase kind of thoughtlessly, but our world, and America included, needs churches that will continue to be an, un, an unmovable pillar of the, of, of the truth and remain an anchor keeping our communities tied to biblical values and right. I think sometimes that's, that's not the only thing we're supposed to be doing, but it seems like as the nation or communities go further from truth, we're doing everything we can just to hold on to their shirt tails to keep them from going too far. In some ways, we're supposed to be doing that. But many today, even saved people, have lost sight of the need for their church or for churches in general. You saw this probably if you have Facebook, but a couple of months ago, um, the slogan at least was all over my Facebook page saying the church is essential. And the idea was because some uh, government officials did not believe that to be so and churches were closed, but that phrase was popular even among those that have had zero interest and still aren't in church um, and haven't been at least for the last several months. But churches in the true sense of the word, churches in the true sense of the word church are essential whether people recognize it or not, and whether government leaders see it or not. But God has always had a way to deal with problems. For example, when sin came in, God decided, well, God already had a plan, but when sin came in, He sent His Son to be a Savior. When the world did not have biblical understanding of God or of what is right and wrong, God sent His Word. And now, when the world is lost and full of lost people, Jew and Gentile, God sent churches. That's our responsibility to reach this world and to glorify God. But one of the many things that Jesus did during His time on earth was to create and establish the very first church. Uh, the world already had the nation of Israel. That's what God used as the vehicle for getting truth to people in the Old Testament, but they rejected Him. Jesus, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Jesus set aside the nation of Israel. He still loves them, cares about them. They're still His people. Um, but God has set them aside for usage, and now is using mainly Gentile, but using churches to evangelize the world and give the truth to people. That's what God uses today. This Grace Baptist Church is one of God's tools to reach the world. So, when Jesus began His ministry and called the apostles to follow Him, He began the first church that ever existed. 
from which came many other churches. The church, that was the church that would later set at Jerusalem. From that came the church of Damascus and Antioch and the other churches we see in the Bible, the churches of Galatia, and Ephesus, and Philippi, and Corinth, and all those churches. But in Matthew 16, and we'll do a bit of a Bible study this morning. It'll be perhaps more teachy for a good portion of it. But let's read it in our text in Matthew, 5, Matthew 16, I'm sorry. Matthew 16 and verse 15. Jesus says, he's, I'm sorry, it says, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? So Jesus asked Peter, Who do you think I am? Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And this will be the main text for our message this morning, verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's an important promise, an important truth that Jesus gave in verse 18. That's the very first biblical mention of the word church um, that there is. But Jesus gave this promise. He says, I will build my church. This was a new thing, a new concept. And it was a, not only a new concept, but a promise given by God Almighty. I will build my church. Let's talk about this for a second before we get into the outline. Um, most of you, this will be completely new. I'm sorry, completely new. Completely um, already understood information. But the word church, the Greek word ekklesia, means a called out assembly. Through etymology, the, the changing of the word and things like that, it basically means a called out assembly that belongs to God. It's a, it's a church is a special thing. It's a special group. It's a special body. It's a special congregation. It's the Lord's. You study the Bible, it's a church, a church is a group of baptized believers. Baptism doesn't save you, trusting Jesus Christ and Christ alone to be your Savior saves you. But let me say this, and this is completely missed by many people, some on purpose, just because you're saved, it does not mean that you belong to a church. When Jesus mentions church, he mentions, he's talking about this kind of church, a local assembly. Not all saved people belong to a church. When you got saved, hopefully, if you're, if if you followed biblical instruction, after you got saved, then you follow the Lord in baptism. June 22nd, 2001, I trusted Jesus to be my Savior. That was on a Friday. Two days later, I got baptized by Bethel Baptist Church in Richmond Hill. I became a member of that church when they baptized me. I was saved, a member of God's family. On my way to heaven, that was secure. Two days later, I got baptized and joined a local church. That's God's way of doing things. But a church is a group of baptized believers who join themselves together to worship and serve the Lord. But a church is made up of saved people that decide together we will follow the Lord. A church is also a group of people that belong to one another. The, the, the phrase called out, they're called out from the world and called out from what they're doing and called out from everything else in this, in this world and called out to assemble, to join together, to do something and for a purpose of glorifying God. But we, are, we as a church are called out, we're separated, we're distinct from the sin and darkness of this world, at least we're supposed to be. We are separated from that to something else, to Christ and to each other. We're supposed to be distinct and separate from the world's philosophy, from the world's purpose for existence and beliefs about truth, beliefs about life, beliefs about eternity. We're different than this world. If you're not different than this world, there's something wrong with you and wrong with your spirituality. We're different. We're distinct. We're children of God. We belong to God. We have the Word of God. We're supposed to be different. A church is also a group that is assembled. Before the King James Bible was translated in 1611, uh, the word church did not exist. That was kind of an invented word around that time. But there were other English Bible versions that were being translated and things like that that were good. And before the word church was invented, the, the King James Bible, where it said church, would say assembly or congregation. We're a congregation. That's why we use that word. We're a, we're a smaller local, local visible assembly. But we are, we as a church, we are a united group of believers that purposely make a decision to join ourselves together, to assemble together like we're doing right now, and to serve together to accomplish God's purpose. That's why we're here. You may, you may be here just because, well, that's what Christians are supposed to do. They're supposed to show up, right? But we're supposed to do more than show up. We work together. We bind ourselves together for the purpose of doing the work of God. 
And in order for the work of God to be done right, for the work of God to be done in a biblical way and in the most Christ-honoring way, we do this together as a church. We serve the Lord. We worship the Lord together. But we work together as a body of Christ. And if we're going to be what God intends for us to be today, then we must know what God intended for them then in the Bible. And we ought to be a strong church that believes and behaves as Christ desired them to 2,000 years ago. I want to look at three truths. And again, some of it will be mainly doctrinal, but I want to make plenty of application as well. But I want to look at three truths from this passage that if we learn and follow and practice, that we as Grace Baptist Church can be a church that God can use and God can bless. Number one, let's look at a verse. Verse 18, he says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And let's read the next four words together. Ready? And upon this rock. Let's try that again. And upon this rock. Number one, the church is powerful foundation. The church is powerful foundation. Again, the first time the Bible ever mentions the word church is Matthew 16, 18. It's the first statement that, about the church that shows the foundation of a, of a church. There's lots of world religions and denominations and things like that. But let's just answer some of these basic questions. Who started us? What do we live for? Who is our guide and what is our guide? What is our central truth? Every, all of those things, the answer is Christ. He is our founder. He and His Word is our guide. He and His, in the gospel, He Himself, all the things about Christ and what He's done is our central truth. Jesus asked the question, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say you're this guy and some say you're this guy. But more importantly, Peter, who, who, or to the disciples, whom do you, who, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to that answer, not to Peter himself, to the fact that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that Jesus says, on that rock, I will build my church. The foundation, not of a man, Peter, but on the foundation of who Jesus is. But the foundation and grounds for the church's existence is found in who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ Himself is the foundation and founder of Grace Baptist Church and every biblical church. But Jesus says several things. Our foundation is, He says He's the Christ. Jesus, our foundation is Jesus being the sent one. Our foundation is the sent one, the Christ. Jesus was sent by God to do many things, to reveal Himself, meaning to reveal God. Jesus said, if, 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 Jesus said, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father, because Jesus is God. He came to do the will of God. He fulfilled God's word and God's law and God's prophecies with 100% accuracy. He's the promised Messiah. That's what Messiah means. That's what the Christ means. That he's the promised Messiah that Christ spoke of in Genesis as the seed of the woman. He's the one that was wounded for our transgressions. He's the one that started the new covenant uh, with God so our sins can be forgiven and forgotten and so we can ha- have a home in heaven. The Old Testament spoke again and again and again about whom the, the man, the branch, the seed that God would send, and that was Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. He's the sent one. He says, I'm the Christ, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not only was He the sent one, but He is the Son of God. John 1 says that God became flesh and dwelt among us. How did God become flesh and live with us to dwell among us? In Jesus Christ. God became man without ever ceasing to be God. God in all His holiness and glory came to die for mankind. That's why God became man. This week, and you probably saw it, on CNN, Don Lennon, he says lots of stupid things. But his quote was, admittedly, Jesus was not perfect. That's what Don Lemon said. Don Lemon's a fool for lots of reasons, but that's one of them. Jesus is God. Jesus was God, is God, never will cease to be God. And, if, and as God, He is perfect. He was sinless, spotless, without fault. Any man, any person that says Jesus failed, fell, sinned, had mistakes, is a liar, and they're demeaning God. Jesus, if Jesus was not perfect, Jesus was not God. If Jesus was not God, He is not your Savior. If Jesus is not your Savior, you cannot go to heaven. Kind of important, isn't it? Jesus is the Son of the living God. 
But when we put those things together, we find His purpose. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. So our foundation is the sent one. Our foundation is the Son of God, but our foundation is the Savior. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why God was sent as Jesus. That's why God came to earth as the Son of the living God, so He can die for our sins. Our foundation is Jesus Christ as our Savior. The fact that we have a church because we unite together because our sins are forgiven because we have salvation in Jesus Christ. We unite together over, over, the, over the same biblical doctrine because we believe the same thing to be true about Jesus Christ. Jesus is our uniter. Jesus is our foundation. Jesus and His Word, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, by the way, are all the words of Jesus Christ. But um, that He Himself is our foundation. No man, no, no just empty philosophy. Uh, no man that was, that, was, that was born or decided to start a church in the last couple hundred years. It was Jesus Christ Himself. God Himself is our foundation. Jesus is our founder. He is our head. His Word is our standard. His glory is our purpose. The person of Jesus Christ is what church is all about. We come together because we love Jesus. We come together because we want to worship Jesus. We come together because we want to serve Jesus together. It's all about Him. We live, and by the way, not just as a church united, but at, when, we, when you go home, you still ought to live for Jesus and not to love Jesus and seek to glorify Him. We, we meet together because we have a Savior to worship. We unite together because we all have the same salvation and faith. We were all sinners, destined for hell, but Jesus forgave us and changed us. It doesn't matter what our culture was. It doesn't matter what language we spoke or where we came from. Because we know Jesus Christ, we're united together. That's what a church is all about. We join, we vote as believers, we join together for the same purpose, for the same faith. Jesus is our, is our purpose. He's our foundation. So the church's powerful foundation is Jesus. Again, verse, let's look at verse number 18 again. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, let's read the next five words out loud together. Ready? I will build my church. That was a lot better than the first time. Let's do it again anyways, just for fun. I will build my church. The church is promising fortification. <laughs> it had to be alliterated. Promising fortification. And I'll explain what, why I said fortification. I will build my church. Again, the word church is always, in the Bible, dealing with a visible assembly of believers, just like this one, and never a universal group. Sometimes the word church is dealing with like a church in general. For example, I can talk about the home in America. The home in America is weak. I'm not talking about a universal invisible home with a universal invisible husband and a universal invisible wife that are in charge of everybody. No, it's in general, homes. Right. I'm talking about, we can talk about the church in America. But what I mean by that is churches. The Bible deals with churches as an assembly just like this one. So when Jesus says, I will build my church, He was talking about an assembly just like this one and every assembly like it. The verse does not deal with salvation. It deals with life as an assembly, life as a church, just like Grace Baptist Church. Part of the point is we're not behaving like the church Christ intended us to be if we're not connected to an actual local church. No Christian will ever be what God wants them to be unless they belong to, are faithful to, and serve in a church just like this one. And I'm not saying like this one, meaning we're perfect. We're not a perfect church because we're all sinners, but a biblical church like this one. Everyone needs a church. Church is essential. Not just the fact that they exist in America. Your church that you belong to and you ought to be faithful to is essential. And you, as a member of Grace Baptist Church, you are part of it. You are essential to this church. Grace Baptist Church is essential, is necessary for the spiritual well-being of Hinesville. We're needed. But the, when Jesus says, I will build my church, that's what he's talking about, a church like this one. But he's, he, gives a, he gives a promise. He says, I will build my church. In Matthew, earlier on in Matthew chapter, I think, two or three, Jesus had already called out an assembly. But Jesus says, I will build my church. The word build is used all throughout the New Testament. Many times it's translated this way, edify or to strengthen. 
For example, in Ephesians 4.11, the same word is used. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, for the building up, the strengthening of the body of Christ. Jesus even said that he was with the, one of the things he did with the church in Hebrews 2 is he sang in the midst of the church. That was when he was physically on earth. He sang with us, not with us personally, but with them. But Jesus says, I will build my church, meaning the church that he'd already started, he's going to build it. He's going to strengthen it. That's a wonderful promise. And applying that to us, Jesus is promising, I'm going to build my church. Jesus right now is at work building Grace Baptist Church. The promise here, let me just run through several things. Jesus did several practical things to build that church that we still practice today to build us. For example, and this may sound completely backwards to you, but it's biblical and it's right and, it's, and it does strengthen us. One of the first things that Jesus gave a church to strengthen it is church discipline. That's in Matthew 18, Jesus, uh, uh, verse 17. And if you shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. If you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. The point was, if someone is living in sin, unrepentant sin, they won't get right, then you have to remove them from the church. How does that strengthen a church? The goal of a church is not size, it's purity. I'll say that again. The goal of a church is not size, it's purity. So like, let me say it even better. The, like, the, the goal of a church is its likeness to Jesus Christ. Was Jesus, do you think Jesus was a good pastor? His church ran 11. I'm sorry, his church ran 12. <laughs> and one of them was lost. I read something, you know, when, when at the end of Christ's ministry, the pastor was falsely accused and arrested. The, the treasurer betrayed, him, betrayed the pastor, went out and committed suicide. The other leaders, they disappeared. One was cussing, saying he didn't even know him, <laughs> didn't even know he knew Jesus. Jesus was a perfect pastor, but people aren't perfect. <laughs> but Jesus is at work in, in, in churches to make them better, to make them right, to make them pleasing unto him. We love people, but God cares about the purity of a church. God also gave them communion. When we meet together to remember Christ's shed blood and broken body on the cross, we're strengthened. We're reminded of what Christ has done, and we're reunited again around Jesus. And again, that's a purifying thing, not as a church for, uh, necessarily for a church to mandate purity for everybody else, but for, that's part of it, but also to look on the inside. Jesus also gave baptism. That's another purifying thing because Jesus, the, the Bible teaches if you're not willing to obey the Lord in baptism, you ought not belong to a church. If you're unwilling to admit that you're saved, that's a problem. So he gave communion, he gave the Lord's Supper, he, or the Lord's Supper, he gave baptism. Uh, he also gave pastors and deacons, teachers or leaders or godly examples to help minister, minister to us and help us. One great thing, go to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. One of the greatest things that he gave us, and they're all important, is Jesus gave us his completed word. We have an advantage that first church did not have. In 2 Peter 1, verse 3, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. He says in 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, He says, I'm, Everything you need for life and godliness is found in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. How do we know Jesus? Through His Word. Through those exceeding great and precious promises. God has given us His completed Word so we can know Him. How do we know what to do? How do we know where we ought to go? How do we, ought to, how do, how do we know what we're supposed to do on an individual basis and for our family? We follow the Word of God. We have the Bible to, to strengthen us and to make us strong. And we also, one great thing, another great thing He gave us is, G, is the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was sent to indwell every believer. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. We have the Word of God telling us what to do. And then God gave us all these other pieces to strengthen us and make us strong. God has given us each other for our strengthening and for our building. And Jesus says, it's not up to you to figure it out. It's not up to you to, to just do your very best. But Jesus says, I will build my church. If we are a church that, that is a church of Christ, meaning we belong to the Lord, and we do what's biblical, and we do what's right, Jesus says, I'm going to build you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to make you strong. It's not always based on size and numbers and ministries. But Jesus says, I will make you stronger. He's always doing that. 
Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath began a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Right now, Jesus himself is at work in Grace Baptist Church trying to strengthen us and trying to do that in your own personal life. Our church gets stronger as you get stronger. As our faith deepens, as our relationship with God gets stronger and better, our church gets better. As God leads us, as we're following the will of God and doing what God tells us to do, it strengthens our church. Obviously, more people that are saved and love God that come join us, that can strengthen our church too. But God is at work in your life right now trying to make you stronger. You, can, you ought to let Him do it. But one of the ways, by the way, Jesus says, I will build my church. There's other promises, Philippians 1 could be one, where he deals with him strengthening us on an individual basis. But Jesus, in this promise in Matthew 16, says, I will build my local assembly. Do you want the strengthening, the building that Jesus promises in Matthew 16? You cannot have that apart from a church. I will build my church. There's there's certain spiritual strength and spiritual help you cannot ever get apart from belonging to and serving in and attending faithfully a local church. Can't do it. But there is the church's powerful powerful foundation and the promising fortification. He promises, I will fortify you, I will strengthen you. But I'm glad to know that Christ is at work. You know, things are hard at times, you know, with COVID and then Everything else with the riots that thankfully have ended and then the losing of constitutional rights and things like that, that's a bit scary, isn't it? But right now, God is at work. Jesus himself is at work strengthening us. We don't have to get weaker because people get more scared. We don't have to weaken. We can get stronger because of it. As Rather than living in fear, we turn to the Lord. God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Part of our distinction is when things get bad, we look up to Jesus. I hope that during all of this, at least this group will be growing stronger. One more thing. Back in our text. Our powerful foundation, our promising fortification, and thirdly, our prevailing future. Verse 18 again. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And this is a lot more words, I didn't count them, but let's read the rest of the verse together. Ready? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's a rule now, we have to do it twice. Ready? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Against what? My church. He is the foundation. His work is that he's building us. We have this promise, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. That's, that promise is especially encouraging when it seems like the fight is stronger. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. What are the gates? Just picture a castle or fort. The gates are on their fort, and that's the gates of hell. Not our gates. It means we're on the offensive. We're going after them. We're attacking hell. We're going after souls. And when we go on the offensive, they can't win. The gates of hell, the place of punishment and death, shall not prevail. They will not win. The gates will not prevail, meaning when we approach hell with the gospel of Christ, we're standing before their fort, before their castle, and we can win and we will win. Sadly, when there's any battle, there's casualties, there's injuries. But our side wins the war. We prevail when we attack. But we prevail also when we are, when we are attacked. First John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We win. As bad as things can get, and things might get worse before the rapture takes place, we win. We're on the Lord's side. There have been times where Christians face much, much, much worse persecution than this. We've got it easy. But if things get bad, we're on the Lord's side and we win. 
Well, how so? <laughs> well, Spurgeon said this. Spurgeon said, you can never kill the church till you can kill Christ. You can never defeat the church till you defeat the Lord Jesus who already wears the crown of triumph. It's not about us. It's about our founder. It's about our Savior. How so? We have prayer. Whatever our need is, whatever our burden is, whatever we're lacking, whatever, wherever we're hurting, we can go to God with it and cast all our care upon Him for He cares for us. We have a church family. We unite together. We pray for one another. When we fall, someone else ought to pick us up. When we're weak, when we're struggling, someone ought, ought to go after us. Someone ought to pray for us. Someone ought to invest in us. Someone ought to encourage us. That's what a church does. We have each other. We have the Word of God, which tells us what's true, what's right, where to go, and when to stop. <laughs> We have the Holy Spirit, which not only convicts us, but comforts us and guides us. So when we feel lukewarm, He can forgive. <laughs> he can revive our spirits. When we allow sin to creep in, Jesus Himself can cleanse, can restore our lives. When we go backwards, He can lift us up again and help us grow. So when the devil attacks, it's not over. Because Jesus already has won. And we're on His side. I read this story and it, was, and it helped me remember the importance of the Lord's house, and just us being faithful. And apparently it's a true story. <laughs> uh, it was written as a true story. Missionary James King tells a true story of an African woman in one of his churches. She attended every service, Sunday morning. Um, I don't know if that's Sunday night, but it's every Sunday morning and every Wednesday. She was faithful. And whenever she'd come to church, her mutt dog would come with her. <laughs> and she'd sit on the aisle, and the dog would sit in the aisle next to her. Preaching was over. She'd come forward to the, to, the, to the altar, and she'd pray, and the dog would follow her up and sit next to her uh, at the altar. And she did that faithfully for years. Her husband, he wasn't saved. Uh, he, he was pretty antagonistic towards her going to the house, and he was pretty abusive. One day, this, obviously this isn't right, but it's part of the story, um, and apparently nothing happened to him legally uh, where he was, but one night he got angry and he beat her, and she ended up dying from it. Uh, a little while later, he, the man was at home, and he would notice for two hours every Sunday morning, the dog would disappear. And then on Wednesday nights, for about two hours, the dog would disappear. True story, right? I, I wasn't there, but they say it's a true story. So one day, the guy got curious. And so he decided to follow the dog to wherever he was going on a Sunday morning. He, he went to, saw the church. The dog was sitting on the aisle, apparently next to where his wife used to sit. He sat down, and the invitation came. The dog went to the altar. The man followed the dog to the altar. He was under such conviction over the faithfulness of his wife and over what he heard of the church, he trusted Christ to be his Savior. That may sound silly. And it's not about the dog, it's about the wife. The wife. You never know what impact you're making. You never know what influence you might have. You never know what crazy thing God might use to see people saved. You and your faithfulness to the Lord and faithfulness to what He tells you to do and faithfulness to His house matters. We're a church. We're a church family. Let's get back to all of the things we need to be doing, and we still have many things to do, and there's things that we need to restart, and there's things that we can't restart yet because of people, and there's things that we need to do that we, you know, just we're praying about, and then just we had to stop because of COVID, and things I'm praying about doing, and just... We've got a community to reach. We're supposed to be salt and light and influence our, our nation. But we can only be that, if, and you can only be what God wants you to be if you're faithfulness and serving to the church that God placed you in. So find a place to serve. Be faithful to what the Lord's told you to do. Let's glorify Him and do things His biblical way. Jesus says, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's place ourselves within the bounds of that promise.